Yes. 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 Um, I was completely new. I discovered Mama two years earlier, <laughs> and I really didn't know anything about anything. I was just out of medical school, and uh, I just wanted to be around these fantastic people who were the mother. And I felt from the beginning, I felt like they were family, you know, that distant relatives that felt very at ease with them. But I, I was basically, you have a phrase in French, you know, I was like a little kid who happens to find himself in the playground of a big kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, whoa, it's great, it was a great big kid, but I know I don't really, shouldn't be there, you know, I belong in the kindergarten. <laughs> so, I, you know, I was not very much or occasionally having the opportunity to be taking care of them. Mostly they were taking care of me and <laughs> training me. And uh, I, I'll start with one story. I was embarrassed. I'm very bad with dates, so I look at the date. And I was embarrassed to find it happened in June 86. So this is the story of uh, Faramji's funeral. Haramji was one of the Mamali who lived in the Mehra Nazar, you know, the trust compound. And he had, I suppose, was Baba's order, he didn't touch women. So it was great for me, it meant was <laughs> the nurse, John Foreman, who was there at the time, who would <laughs> take care of him, give him an injection when he had bad asthma. <coughs> the guy was uh, very, uh, what to say? I was frightened of him. <laughs> <laughs> he was fiery. Yes. Anyway, he, he finally died. <laughs> and, uh, in the afternoon, his funeral is going to take place in the Vera Barn. You know, the, the pit has been dug and uh, everybody has come, Papa Lover from town, and Eric and uh, and the moment the ambulance bringing, you know, the ambulance that was hired to bring Haramji's body to Merabad, the moment the ambulance rolls into Merabad, it starts raining. And real monsoon rain, like what we don't see anymore. You know, pouring rain, everybody runs for cover mm. on the verandas. The, you know where the cemetery is, so everybody runs around the job tree or near Madani Hall to take shelter. And for 10, 15 minutes, it's just pouring. And Erich, you know, always very practical, tells the ambulance driver, just wait, you know, we don't want to unload the coffin in, in this rain. Just please wait, we'll, you know, we'll pay you a little more. Just wait. And 10, 15 minutes later, at the time, you know, we used to, when it started raining, you would look at your watch, and then you say, oh, we have. 15 minutes rain, 20 <laughs> minutes deep rain. I don't remember how long this one was. But when it stops, everybody comes back to the cemetery and the coffin is brought. And just then, also, I remember the car bringing Mera, Mera came. And Mera and the women mothering arrived. So now the funeral is going to start. And uh, just as Ted is beginning to drive the first nail into the, you know, to nail the lid of the coffin, we hear a lot of shouting. And on the road, you know, very close on the road near the Duny, in front of our eyes, we see a truck packed with people, you know, they stand in the back of the, of the truck. And the truck swerved to overtake a, a cyclist. And with the road being just uh, wet, we see the truck skidding, oh, and in front of our eyes, like in slow motion, it turns and it lands on its side. And you have now a pile of people 
you know, inside this truck, and some of them running around with blood on their face, shouting. It's like a a, a war zone, and uh, the main residents are already there, you know, pulling people from the top of the pile. But it looks like the one at the bottom are going to be dead, and. I am telling myself I'm a doctor, I have to go there. <laughs> and I can't move. Really, my feet are, I think they are in cement, I have no command on my legs. I can't take one step. Because I'm having this argument with Baba, and it's the embarrassing part, but um, I'm telling Baba, this is not right, you know, this is a funeral. We are all here for a funeral, we're not here for this. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready to be the doctor, I'm for, I came for a funeral, what do you want me to do, all these casualties, and I'm all alone, I mean, it's just, no, this is not right, you know, this is not the right time. <laughs> this should not be happening, I can't do it. What to say, that's what was going on in my brain. And when bothered me knows I, I should be there, but I can't do it. And then, a thought happens, and I know it doesn't, you know, this thought was not generated from my brain. I sort of almost <laughs> saw it being broadcast and being <laughs> on the side. And it says, it was not my word, it was saying, You have an ambulance right here on the premises. You have an ambulance. <laughs> okay, and at the time, getting an ambulance was a, a major accomplishment. And with that realization that you know, there's already an ambulance here, suddenly I sort of unfroze and my legs can move and I go towards the, the action and everything went just so easily. You know, I think ten steps before I am there, there is one guy who had been strolled. He was sitting you know, on the seat on top of the cabin where the driver is. So this one look. He has a broken femur. Um, the next second, somebody is at my side. Um, it's Eric saying, what do you need? I say, bring the stretcher for this man, the stretcher from the ambulance. And, you know, at every step it was obvious what to do. And within a very short time, the serious casualties were in the ambulance. There were also cars. In Mirabad, which was not usually there was one car in Mirabad, mm. but people had come from down the funeral, so other people were put in like Adidu Basha's car, and uh, we had like 20 people with a broken wrist. Oh my they gosh. all, you know, yeah. put their hand out. So it was like, oh, just a broken wrist, next one. Yeah. So, <laughs> Bob Street was giving them homeopathy. Anyway, <laughs> I remember somebody came. Uh, the message from Dr. Boer. Dr. Boer asked how many people died. He said, what? Well, he died. <laughs> and we put them in the ambulance to see the hospital. And I mean, there are many stories connected to Farabi's funeral, but that is my side of the, my coverage of the event. And um, it showed me really um, there's no point arguing <laughs> it's not the right time, and and he's there to help you. You know, when you need an ambulance, you have an ambulance. Um, and basically, what I realize is, all I need to do is to show up and to <laughs> trust that he will be there to do to see to everything, to send the help and all. So that's basically what I. In all these years, I was sort of just swimming up, shaking in my boots, and saying, <laughs> up, what, you know, who is there to help and what should I do? And realizing that his help really was, was always available. So I don't feel I did uh, anything much except keep myself to show up. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it sometimes. And, uh, From the second year of my stay here, was spent at Merzah. And um, 
Every child is having this lifelong habit. He would start the day with a walk. And when I was at Nevazan, uh, and I stayed in different places depending on my duties, but I ended up being in what used to be Mount room, which is sort of next to my new home. And I was between the men's side and the women's side, so I spent a lot of my time on the men's side. I spent in and now here I would start my day with Erich coming in for a walk. And, you know, we're talking of 72 years ago, and uh, he, was, he was strong at the time, and he would, we would walk, I mean, I can't believe it, we would walk all the way to the Morangabad Road, we would walk all the way around Seclusion Hill, or we would walk, you know, to the reservoir. Now there's hardly any water there. So we, it was a great way to, to start the day. And, uh, you know, Erich knew the name of the plants and which ones were medicinal. And, and he knew everybody. You know, the people going to work on their bicycles would stop and come to bring in. And they would say, oh yes, this one will work with us for a while, this one. Yeah, I do this one was here, this one. But it was so, you know, you would see it in this people's face when they would come, you know, get on their bicycle or their motorcycle to come and, and greet him. They remembered Papa, you know, they remembered uh, this time when they had the, the connection. And another habit of Erich during his walk, he had his pockets full of um, prasad for the kids. <laughs> so, of course, all the children on the approach road would come running because they would get. Uh, <laughs> he would give them the, the prasad that's used for our you know, it's called this sesame uh, seeds. And he would give uh, not just one. <laughs> and I would argue with him that he was <laughs> ruining their teeth and he should be looking at me to get tablets, but he doesn't um, have that. And so, one day we are further, we are not on the usual, usual, you know, the nearby road. We are further down, near the, what they call the bumping station. And coming opposite us, you know, from the opposite direction, there is a young woman with a little, you know, a three-year-old toddler. Uh, and I see this kid uh, leaving his mother's side, running across the road, and, you know, what he's doing, he throws himself in there with his legs, you know, grabbing oh. his <laughs> knees. And, you know, it's very sweet to see that. And I think another kid who wants Candy. And then I happen to notice the mother's face on the other side of the road, and she is just in shock. So what is that? Who are these people? Why did my oh. child run to this man? I mean, she, it's not one of the regular people on the, living on the road to Nerza. And I started telling myself, asking myself, what did that little kid see? Mm -hmm. what what made him turn to Erich like that? You know, this mm. recognition of, they said, children see, or what did he see that he came? So Erich called the, you know, Erich called the mother over and says, we are followers of Lea Baba, we are there, and he did the facade also. He was, he was like that. That was, uh, that was my joy. Okay, the morning. Mm -hmm. Let me look at my little, <laughs> <laughs> my little notes. Oh, so after a year of my being there, uh, I think it was Jal complained that all the medical people are <laughs> in their side. <laughs> <laughs> Shelley, Dr. Anne, and we need somebody 
Adria, Adria died and he found a silver boer posted me back to Merba. But I asked Erich permission, saying, I need on Sundays, I need to come and <laughs> walk with you. And he said, sure. <laughs> so, you know, till Erich, uh, as long as Erich was going for his morning walks, on Sundays I would get up earlier than usual and get on my scooter and go to my husband to, to walk with him. And in the beginning, there was a little uh, nervousness that uh, what was Mera going to say? Because if Mera said, no, no, it's not safe for a woman to go alone at this time. So I told Mera, Mera, at 5 o'clock in the morning, the bad people are going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and it's only the good people who are out. <laughs> and so she had no objection. <laughs> And it's true, you know, one, true, uh, yeah. one day I'm on my way there and uh, one tire burst. Huh. And one guy with an out of it with his wife taking their morning walk just found it very normal that it was his job to change it. Oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, that was the Sunday morning habit. And uh, you know, now we are many years later, and um, I read that in my notes recently, I've forgotten all about that. I had just got a, a new scooter, and it was much lighter than the old model I was used to. And it had rained, so the, the approach road Merza was full of mud. And uh, there is rats, and on my new scooter, uh, I got scared I was going to skid, so I'm getting there uh, not at all uh, confident of my abilities to keep the scooter up. And uh, I must have been late this morning because I only met every shot halfway. And he compliments me on the new scooter. And without saying anything, the next thing I know, he gets on the scooter. <laughs> and he changes the mood completely. You know, now I am I'm not going to spill because I, I can't put everything in that. <laughs> Plus having his weight meant more traction, you know. So, so very you know, in a completely different mood, I drove the scooter all the way to Merazan and parked it, and then we went for the walk. But when I read that story, I realized that was typical of the Malanese ways, you know, to, uh, to help you without seemingly doing anything, mm. to, to boost your confidence. To, you know, to make it obvious that this was you were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I need a little sip of something. <laughs> Nobody has a door, just me. You're on, you're at. You are at. What do you need to hear? With one million. I don't know if she's ready for them yet. Yeah, there's a lot many stories it's hard to decide which one. <laughs> So this uh, not many people were so completely Baba, you know, they were sort of breathing Baba. They, that what was made them so special and so appealing and 
Actually, when you were busy, I knew sure that I'm straight. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for example, Koshet. You know, Koshet was uh, living in the, in the trust of his hometown. And uh, with her were Sudam and Asha. Asha was taking care of her. And two little kids, uh, Rima and Dashana, <laughs> were born. one of my first visits and second one when I came to stay. So it was a really nice place to see and relax there. It was not a spiritual training. It was playing with little kids. It was a, a nice place to chill out, you say. <laughs> and um, and Koshet had a lot of um, health problems. She had asthma and heart problems and this and that, so I was often called to, to take care of her. And one day I forgot what she had. And the next day when I got to check on her, she tells me she had a dream of Baba and Mera. And I thought, oh, she had a dream of Baba and Mera, that means <laughs> so I, I sent a note to go here and uh, oh, she had this and that and I'm giving her this and that and she dreamt of Baba and I said she's going to die <laughs> and she didn't die <laughs> and the next time she had uh, another medical problem it happened again and it took me quite a while to see that it didn't mean anything. It was sort of a routine for Porsche to dream of Baba and Mera. It was, it was not a sign. <laughs> but I guess they, you know, they looked so old to me, people like Ben Yu and Porsche. And, I, and because I was a doctor, I always felt that and to interpret many things as being in the world of design. where I really felt it was time to leave. <laughs> Enough of that. You need to take care of yourself and be serious about life, you know, earn money and uh, go back to France. You know. And repeatedly I would come to that decision. <laughs> and I would decide I'm going to tell Eric on Sunday you know, I walk. And we would start the walk and I would feel, if I tell him now, so I'm going to ruin his time. You know? <laughs> so I'm going to tell him at the end of the walk. You know, the, Eric spent his days answering questions, you know, paying attention to people. and uh, It was like his time, the morning time was his time to be alone or it's just, you know, just selected people once a week and was there. But I was quite aware that the guy needed some space to, to himself. So I would say, okay, hold your tongue and we can. And repeatedly during the walk, Eric should say something. And I would change my mind completely. <laughs> <laughs> And it could be just plain, you would call it flattery, you know. He would 
As we are coming back, you will hear a big sigh and say, Oh dear Anne, <laughs> who would have thought that Abba would send a doctor all the way from France? <laughs> 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 Yes, <laughs> this is me <really> again. <laughs> and I'm not going to quit today. <laughs> it happened so many times, you know. I have uh, another time he told me, you know, Papa paid for so and so to go to a new school. And where are they now? Where they are? In England. Or he paid for so and so to go to nursing school. And where are they now in Bombay? And this one. And that one. And he sends you. <laughs> so, so really, I can't take the credit. You know, it's, between Baba and Eric, uh, they plotted to, to bring me and to keep me here. <laughs> <laughs> another, another story that comes to mind of you know, Baba taking care of me is one uh, Amatiti story. So it, uh, it must be again in the early 80s. And at that time, during Amatiti, I would spend the nights at the hill in a little room at the back of Mantali's kitchen. Because Mera and the ladies you know, would be also spending the night there in the east room, which used to be in Mera's room. So I was up there on Amatiti duty. And um, people like Casey, Andrea, people who were living in Ahmed Nagar would move to Merabah during that time and would stay in my room. And also the people which had them close for a couple of days, all the foreign pilgrims were uh, rehoused in the staff quarters. You know, in every at the time, I think the staff was very full, and every resident had two or three children uh, sleeping on the floor in their room for a few days. So, uh, before Amadidi even started, there are, this is a situation where there are people in, in my room, and uh, one of the women who is staying in my room. It's now 10 o'clock at night, and she's not back. And you know, there's a curfew in, in Merabah, but before I'm on TV, so it's anyway, she, she saw the rules in not apply. Mm -hmm. So it's 10 o'clock, it's time to go to bed, and you can't lock the door because somebody is not in. And uh, what to do? It's not safe to go to sleep if the door is not locked. If we lock, then she has to. Knock and wake up everybody. We had a discussion. I was really not happy at all. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? You know, no consideration. And, and finally, maybe 10 30, this person shows up, and in three minutes, she's brushed her teeth, she's asleep. And I'm so full of anger. And, <laughs> and you know, these people do not follow the rules and what do they think they are? And I am somebody with responsibilities. And, and uh, everybody in the room is snoring like this. <laughs> and I know it's, it's myself who is keeping me awake, but I can't sleep. <laughs> so the next morning is now we are on the 30th of January. Amatiti uh, is going to start for, in earnest, and when I don't sleep, I'm not, uh, I'm not doing good. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I've had breakfast now. It's time to get my bag and my sleeping bag and move to my Amatiti quarters at the hill. 
Yeah, I'm so tired, so I lie down for 10 minutes. But, you know, the person who have already moved in my room, so there's a bag, and the person who's going to sleep in my bed has even brought books, and she's put books on the windowsill, you know, some people have time to read. <laughs> So, you know, I'm lying there, and I can't, you know, can't really sleep, but, so I grab the book, and it's roomy, and I open it, and I read two lines, and just reading these two lines of roomy, you know, changes something, and I feel completely rejuvenated, and able to go. And the two lines, and then be sure to get that straight. Two lines are, when you are with everyone but me, you are with, you are with no one. Ah. When you are with no one but me, you are with everyone. Ah. And really, just reading that, when you feel exhausted and grumpy, something strong enough to have me ready to go. And I remember, because after I was eating, during one of our morning walks, I told Erich, you know, Erich, this happened before I was eating, and I read these two lines, and uh, Erich said yes, because Rumi was, uh, I think, was realized. So this, uh, these words have come from the truth. They have power, and even centuries later, even translated, uh -huh. you know, this is this is the effect of that power. Uh -huh. So you know, again, it was just a question of showing up, and the energy source was given from through Rumi. Mm. Oh, good. Then what time do we stop? <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Whenever you, you have plenty of time, whatever suits you. When I, when I was in Merazan, that was the second year of my living here. Um, at the time, you know, I thought I was I was good. <laughs> I was certainly <laughs> as good or even better as the Americans who were over there. <laughs> and when I moved to Merazan, everything I did was wrong. You know, was just, <laughs> um, for example, I would be. In the dispensary in the afternoon, when there is, you know, dispensary is closed, I would just be there you know, <laughs> trying to learn Marathi or reading. And I would leave for a few minutes to go to the bathroom. Within the three minutes, I'm gone. Katie would walk in. <laughs> what is that? There's nobody here, the fan is going. <laughs> <laughs> and when Katie was not happy, she would broadcast it you know, loud and clear <laughs> to everybody on the men's side, on the women's side, Dr. Ann is not in the room, the fan is on, the light is on. <laughs> and it was very embarrassing because, it, you know, I was brought up to pay attention to these things. I mean, I would not leave for 
a long time. <laughs> you know, the lights off. But I was really just gone for a few minutes. <laughs> it just kept happening on air. <laughs> Another thing that I kept doing is at the time, you know, we didn't have this horrible uh, needle that syringes, so I would boil, I would boil the uh, needles and syringes. And but you, you have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I would forget, and Katie would walk in, and the gas is going on, and all the water has evaporated, and there's just some little <laughs> balls that's standing back at the bottom of the pan with the needles, and who would in charge that doctor? I had. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Katie was. Hammering me, but Dr. Goya, very practical, would give me a timer. <laughs> she said, You put that in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was part of the, of the grinding that year at Merza, and I. It was not about being good, it was about. Uh, you know, Another example is uh, Kitty. You know, Kitty would come and spend a month, I think, every year, uh, living with the women mother. So, and she would stay at Berza. So, Dr. Boer uh, so put me in charge of taking care of Kitty's needs. She didn't want Kitty to exert. So, I've never met Kitty before, and it turned out to be quite an enjoyable job because Kitty was so, <laughs> it was so easy. I remember the first time a boy wanted me to comb her hair. She didn't want Kitty to, you know, to do that herself. So here I am trying to braid Kitty's hair. <laughs> and, and, you know, Kitty, I used to have braids when I was. 12 years old, but it's been a long time, and I'm not quite sure how to do that right. And she said, oh, of course, of course. <laughs> Baba, Baba always asks us to do something that we don't know how to do. <laughs> Once we've learned how to do it, you know, it transfers you to do something else. So she, she didn't mind the brain was quite, quite the same. Anyway, that day, I... I'm taking baths. One of my difficulties in Merazan was when to take the baths. <laughs> I had to share bathrooms, Vano and Anabas, with Meru. And then the Meru was in charge of the hot water. And she had it. The bath water was heated on the wood fire, and you would get your bucket. So, and then there was Mera. Mera, Mera would spend most of the night up and talking to Baba. When she felt in the day, she was distracted by the human. She, she felt she would not you know, focus on Baba. Was, uh, was not there because she was telling stories. She was telling Baba stories to, to the people. So, the night was her time to be with Baba. And then, uh, you know, very late, she would, uh, she would go to sleep. So in the morning, she would wake up much later than the other women. And uh, there was no fixed timing. The morning RT in, in the women in Baba's room was when Mera was ready, when Mera would call. So, you had to figure that out. You know, mm -hmm. When is Arti going to be? Do I have time to run a bath or not? So Meru was usually the one who we knew when she would. No, no, no. Mera is going to take her bath now. The hot water is for her. Or no, no. Take you know, take your bath now. You have plenty of time. So I'm there taking my bath, and sure enough, when I'm in the middle of it. There is a bell for Artie. <laughs> <laughs> right. But Kitty, you know, Kitty used to stay in Mary's room. So I hear Casey coming to uh, 
in Kitty. And Kitty had the problem with her knee, so she couldn't climb the steps. So she would have to go all the way around mm-hmm. to go to Baba Chow for the prayers. And of course, uh, she would fall very fast. So I calculate, you know, I have about three minutes. Uh, <laughs> time is going to take for Kitty to go all the way there. So. You know, I can do it. I am prince. I try up. I comb my hair. I jump in my clothes, and I get into Baba's room when everybody is about to start the prayers. And you know, I feel so proud of myself. <laughs> and Mani is about to start the prayers, and she takes one look to the right, to the window, and says, "Oh." Who left the door to the bathroom open? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that door was supposed to be closed all the time. And who had left it open? <laughs> <laughs> and it's something that took me a long, long time to learn. At the moment, I would feel proud that I've done something. And <laughs> 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 I would put the rag from and the unit. Another, you know, stories of the same line is uh, with Goher and uh, obedience, you know, what obedience meant. Um, one year, the family was coming with a child who had asthma, and these people were especially close to Mera. And Mera was quite worried, what if this child has asthma? So everybody was talking about that. So we had sort of go ahead and car, so people should be waste of her weight, she should get so many milligrams, injection of so many milligrams of this. So, you know, everything was ready in case there was a problem with that, that child. And uh, because this family had relatives in town, they were not staying in Merabah, they were staying in town. So, Merabah saw that the doctor in town should be uh, informed. So, go ahead and tell me, um, Merabah is really worried about, about this. So, you go and meet the pediatrician and you ask him in case of a problem in the night. You know, would he be ready to go and do a house call for them? So I, I knew this uh, doctor I met him a few times. So I thought, you know, I am not uh, going to town meant you know, half a day. I'm going to call him. So I make a phone call, I explain the situation. And he was very obliging. He actually lived in the same area of town. He sure no problem. You know, give them my phone number. If there is a, they just call me and I will come. And a few days later, boy asked me, so did you meet Dr. So and so? And I said, yes, yes, I talked to him on the phone and he says, yes, he will come if there is a problem and we do a house call. I talked to him on the phone. And, you know, I don't remember what happened, but I had to, you know, sometime later, I had to meet this doctor. And he told me, Dr. Gohan came to see me, because he had just moved in a new office. And I told her, I'm so happy and so honored that you came to see my office, but please don't come again, because I could see how difficult it was for her to find a step in oh my personal office. And I realized, because Mera had said, go and talk to him, and I just made a phone call. Go ahead, I felt this is not sufficient. So she didn't tell me, I told you to go, you go, and she just went herself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was no need. She, she climbed the stairs to, to see him in his personal office, and Again, you know, repeat the situation and request him to be ready for a house call. So I realized when you are told 
you go and see so and so, you don't make fun when you go and see so and so. Mm. And um, another example is um, he went below to visit. Um, he went below was from Switzerland. She had mm-hmm. yeah, she had uh, my Baba in Cannes, when Baba was in France in Cannes. And then she came, you know, with the Western women and she lived up the hill in Mirabal. I'm very good mistake, but this is during the Second World War, you know, from I think thirty eight till the end of the war. And when I would go to France, I would visit Irene in Switzerland, and she was a, a great friend, and uh, I really liked visiting with her because she knew what it was like, you know. And I could tell her, oh, yeah. <laughs> Katie is always finding fault with me. Or, uh, <laughs> I, I love Irene. Mean. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Shortly after I came to be a, a resident, somebody offered Irene a ticket to come to India. And she had not been back to India all these years. So, Mera and all the ladies were very happy to see her again, and she was going to be invited and have lunch with Mera. And um, Irene also was a, somebody with asthma. She could get into severe asthma. So I was supposed to be with her and go with her everywhere. I know Jackson I used to drive her around with the oxygen cylinder in the car. We were really ready for any emergency. So anyway, before Irene comes, go ahead, tell me, <coughs> Mera wants to have some really special lunch when Irene comes. She wants to, she's thinking of having fish. So please find out if Irene eats fish. All right. <laughs> Simple question. But you know, I'm smarter than that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to ask Irene if she eats fish because I know when I go to see her in Switzerland, she gives me meat. So she's not a vegetarian. So if she's not a vegetarian, she eats fish. So I said, oh yes, yes, I mean, it's fish. Mm-hmm. And I never checked with Irene. <laughs> and uh, Irene comes, and the day comes when she's going to have lunch at Merza, and I'm with her. And uh, Mera says, Irene, for you, we have prepared fish. And Irene says, Oh, Mera, I'm so sorry, but I'm terribly allergic to fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Baba. Oh, no. Oh, no, yes. She's <laughs> about to go under the table. <laughs> oh, dear. And swim away. Yeah. And, and, you know, Mera didn't say anything, and Boher didn't, you know, I don't think any of them said anything. I guess I've been at Rice and Dara or but I learned a lesson. You know, you don't use your smartness in figuring out what you just <laughs> okay, it's six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not over yet. But well, I'm running out of stories. Mm-hmm. Well, how about people asking questions? Oh. I said, I'm all frightening. Did you go and close the bathroom door so I could oh, yes. start? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I <laughs> never left it open again. Hope so. I never did. I remember Jack smiled and told me when I moved here there's three things you experience humiliation, <laughs> embarrassment, and shame. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hmm. You came as a pilgrim, but when did you when did you change, or what changed you to become a full time resident? Well, you know, on my second visit here, from the first time, we felt like this place felt like home. And on my second visit, it was even more, more so. This is home. This is where I should be. But, you know, when I looked around, the people who were staying here were American, and they seemed to have no problem with money. <laughs> I was not American, and I just finished medical school, and I had no money. But, you know, that urge to be here was so strong. So I, and I didn't know who, who was who. So I picked up one resident randomly, and I picked up Kevin Nordin. <laughs> and I went up to him one day and I said, uh, so what, what work do you do here? <laughs> and he told me, you don't come here to work, you come here to be worked upon. <laughs> I remember the word, I remember his words exactly, but I just I had no idea what it meant. I didn't pay attention to that. And I asked my second question, how do you support yourself? And he said, I work on construction sites for three months in America. And the cost of living in Merabad is, you know, the, it's so much less than in America. But what I earn in three months in America, I support myself the rest of the year in India. So I thought, if you can do that, I can do that doing temporary doctor's job. And maybe the next day, literally, at mm -hmm. Merza, I would have Dr. Gohan in the dispensary. She turns to me and says, It would be so great if you could come and help me. Oh, and I said, Well, you know, I've really been thinking about it. So that's how it started, I came for one year. And uh, towards the end of the year, I'm not getting money. Money, I don't want to go, but I don't have money to stay. I said, you go and money and you come back. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it was for. Uh, Did it work out that two, three months in France was enough for the rest yeah, of the year it, here? It worked out for. Somewhere or other you know, for the first ten years, and then you know, Bala provided all the arrangements. Now, you traveled a lot with Balji. Do you have any particular experiences you want to share of that? Oh, that's where those were great times, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, after about well, his second cancer surgery, and he had a colostomy, and it took him quite a while to to recover, to adjust, and. You know, um, I can't remember dates properly, but the, the first trip we did after that was a trip to Delhi for Vita Fong. I got, remember getting a phone call from Pat saying, Fauji uh, has to go to Delhi and you need to come with us. So we were in Delhi for like a week to so the, these are some people who have been asked to leave. I think I can tell that story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, at the time, that's how it would, would happen. Uh, we've been to every person in Delhi and the, you know, the local MLA from Abednagar. Everybody who supposedly can help, and nobody can do anything. And we've been to the, the I think it's home, uh, home office, or wherever that office is, where I've seen the man who's in charge of the, the 
five or two or three vegetables, I don't remember who it was. And the guy is like, no, why should I do something special for these people? Uh, no way. And now she says, well, maybe Papa wants them to go. And we are due to fly back to Amenaka the next day. And now she says, let's go one more time. <laughs> and it's, you know, now she was tired. He was having chemotherapy at the time. He was, he was not well. It was, so it means, you know, getting in a car, in the daily traffic, and then it was you know, in this government office. And the guy is still the same, not very pleasant man. Uh, there is no reason I should do anything special for you. And I see him, why did Auji insist on coming one more time? And then the phone on this guy's desk rings. Hello? And you see the guy, you know, immediately <laughs> sitting up straight, like, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. Uh, yes, sir, they are in my office right now. <laughs> <laughs> All our ears, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, some Bavanova finally had gotten hold of the person who could do that, you know. Mm. So the guy puts his phone down and we signed the papers. And, wow. Um, and we came back and we had problem of this two or three person was so because Bauji had decided to go one more oh, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. But look at the timing. Yes. Hey, look at your notes for a minute. <laughs> well, I think... <laughs> Change the tape. Yes. Well, there's nothing left on the notes. <laughs> And then he, he called me a couple of months after, after that, saying, the Bavarovas from Hamirpur say you are not coming, you know, you've gone everywhere, you've gone to America, you're not coming to see us. <laughs> and he was, uh, he told me, I have to go. Can you come with me? And I said, sure, I'm going with you. And that turned out, it was more than two weeks, two more. It was in March, I don't know where, it was 90 something, when we were 94, maybe 96. So there were quite a a few of us, uh, Daddy Keravala had asked Bauji to ask about to take you to go to Amirpur, I want to go with you. Mani Damania was also with us. Biff had uh, hired a car and was, there was a group of people following with Biff. There were three men, of course. And I was quite, uh, I was quite an adventure. I'd never expected things to be like that. And uh, that would be a whole, uh, whole evening of, <laughs> of stories. But I remember first we went by train to, <coughs> to Jansi, and then <coughs> we were traveling by car. And what would happen is, you know, there is a program, there is a set plan, there is a schedule, <laughs> and. Uh, so we're driving to the next place where Bauji is supposed to talk. That almost every side road, people who were living in that, that road, who could not afford or could not take the day off to go to the next town where Bauji would be speaking, would just come to the main road with the Baba flag, oh. a picture of Baba on a chair. And they, oh. they knew that Bauji's house <laughs> would use to pass oh. by. So every place, Bauji had to stop. And he would <laughs> embrace everybody who was there. And they always had something to offer, a kettle of tea or biscuits or fruit. Um, they would, uh, you know, if it was in the sun, four men would hold up uh, a sheet, you know, over Bauji to have like a 
wherever you went to protect him from the sun. And uh, sweet, it was, I mean, I was just totally stunned on this, on this trip. You know, the, the, and they really, you know, the Bauji had that connection that Baba, he was doing the Hindi correspondence mm -hmm. for Baba. So they knew him from that. But um, it was amazing. You know, sometimes uh, you'd be driving through fields of uh, a lot of mustard fields, mm -hmm. you know, mustard fields, mm -hmm. and you arrived in the middle of nowhere. And they had <coughs> the local. Uh, Music group was uh, with a loudspeaker on a battery on a bicycle. We <laughs> had that on day somewhere. It was just, I mean, they were really, everything they had was out there for Pauji, mm. for, for Baba. And uh, of course, the schedule and the timing and the program would uh, always be late. And, I was left to worry about what is blood sugar and what kind of lunch going to be and so on. It would take another hour to tell all the stories from that. Curi think, curious if you accompanied him. Did he ever visit France? Did yes. He, if he yes, did, yes. were you there? Mm -hmm. Look at that. Um, he didn't speak French, so. Uh, yeah, I was even translating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the funny thing. <laughs> okay, that's the one. <laughs> we we are we are um, we stay in, a, in somebody's house you know, in the, near Paris, and uh, so in the afternoon, Claudia would speak in the garden you know, under a tree. And, uh, and uh, Baba people would come and they would tell their friends. So one time, some, uh, you know, there's a people ring at the gate and I go to open the gate and it's women who have heard that some, uh, somebody from India, you know, their friend has told them to come. And I forget what they say. They say something like, we have come to see the saint from India. <laughs> and I say, oh, no, no, you know, it's just, Bauji is an ordinary person. <laughs> but he, he, he was a disciple of Meher Baba, who was a very extraordinary person. And then I bring them in, I introduce them to Bauji. And I said, oh gee, I told them you were an ordinary person, but you were with Mea Baba. And oh gee, didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the visit, he would repeat to me and then, ah, you think I'm an ordinary person. <laughs> <laughs> She says, I'm ordinary. I'm ordinary. <laughs> 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 so he, he proved otherwise. <laughs> we had extraordinary connections. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he yeah. went to France, especially after his uh, heart surgery. He had a heart surgery in. May, I would think. And, um, and then I saw that the end of his traveling, but you know, the first post-operative visit, he asked the doctor, when can I travel? <laughs> and when can I fly? And they say, two months, three months, or whatever. And Paul Kumar organized that he would go just to France, you know, not a long you know, transatlantic flight, but he went to France. and. Uh, I was um, I was with him just at the end of that trip, and I flew back with him. 
And that's when, that, that's the time when Raoji kept talking about Erich, you know, and oh, yeah. he had a dream about Erich dying. And when we landed in Bombay, I had to really insist to, for us to wait a few hours in the lobby of the Lila, but he just wanted to get back from Avendaga. Mm. So I had a very hard time convincing him to you know, relax with the Lila and walk in the lobby and have something to eat and, you know, maybe a the flight must have been Air France, it meant at midnight, but you know, at two or three in the morning, we are in the car heading for <laughs> Ahmednagar. <laughs> and we arrived at about 10 o'clock in the trust office, and surprise, the car from Erzat was there, and Erich had come. Mm. And I remember it was a Thursday, and normally on a Thursday, Eric stayed at Merza to talk to people. And that day he had decided he was coming to the office. So, how he met Eric, I met Eric, and Eric died at night. Mm. So, you know, again, there was a clear connection and somebody in charge of the and that is my time. I have <laughs> 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 time for a break. It's wonderful. <laughs>